But keep in mind too, you can have a confidence if you ask anything according to the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about that? Not what pastor has to say, what I have to say. What does God have to say? Amen? It's what God says. That's where your, your faith is in Him. Believe upon Him. I like that one Galatians is, it's the will of God we be delivered. Sounds like we praise, you. yeah, yeah. This is what heaven looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, yeah. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, hey, yeah. We'll see you break down. We'll watch the giants fall. Well, fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, oh, oh we praise you. Oh,
Yes, God.
And I was made for more. So much more. So why would I make made my shame with a fountain of grace running my way? I know I am yours. And I was made for more. Yeah. He has a destiny for each one of you, a purpose. Glory to God. Come on, praise him for it. Hallelujah. But we're going to give our guest speaker lots of time today. I forgot to mention he has a wife and three children. So awesome. All right, come on, let's welcome our guest speaker back for the second time, Mason Hoover. Glory. Praise God. Put your hands together for Jesus. <laughs> and you can be comfortably seated. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this high honor to come into your presence. Thank you, Father. We're in the realm of possibility this morning that all things are possible to him who believes. Thank you to be amongst the believers this morning. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we come against any principalities, powers, holding the hearts and the minds of the people, and we adjure it, be thou removed in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we give you free reign this morning. Move among the hearts and the lives of the people like only you can move. What silver and gold cannot buy, the sweet presence of God. And all the people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, it is great to be with you this morning. Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord, church? I said, who's excited? This is word alive, not word dead, church. Amen. And let me see if these people are alive out here, pastor. Man, we got some good looking people this morning. They got their Sunday best on. Praise God. Well, I'm excited for this morning. And uh, I'm excited to pray for the sick. I love to pray for the sick. I love to see people get healed. And do you know why? So God can be glorified. You know, before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he said so God could be glorified. One reason why we pray for the sick is to glorify God, to give him all the glory and all the praise. That's one reason why God still heals and he remembers his covenant. I love what God told Moses before he went to deliver the Israelites. He said, I have not forgotten my covenant with Israel. And this morning, God has not forgot his covenant he cut with you for divine healing. God paid the ultimate sacrifice for your divine healing this morning. Not just your salvation, your salvation as well, but for your deliverance, your freedom. God sent the ultimate sacrifice, his only begotten son to this earth. And he stood in heaven as he watched his son beaten. And even by his stripes, he took a beating for your divine healing. And when you don't preach divine healing, when people don't believe in divine healing, it's a slap in God's face. You think that pleased God to watch his son get his skin tore open and whipped and beaten for people not to believe in divine healing. I believe in divine healing. I believe in the word of God. 
the variant revelations the Bible says, if you take away from this book, I will take you out of the book of life. And people have been taking divine healing out of this book. Amen. Divine healing is your covenant. Yeah. And we continue to believe God's word. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen. I'm going to go out swinging. Amen. Say, I'm going to go out swinging. Amen. I'm going to go out believing God at his word. I've made up my mind. I'll pray for the sick for 50 years even if no one gets healed. Why? Because it's commanded of God. He said, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Yeah. It's not my responsibility to heal. It's my responsibility to act on the word of God. Yeah. It's my responsibility to do what God told me to do and he will do what he said he will do. Amen? Amen. And just so happens people do get healed. Amen? Amen. Yeah. That would have been a tough 50 years, Pastor, of praying for the sick, and nobody gets healed. But I had one problem, Pastor. I had such a passion to pray for the sick. The Lord told me that I have a healing ministry. I'm a healing evangelist. That's my lane. But I had one problem. Nobody was getting healed. So you come to a fork in the road. You know, do, do you change your doctrine? Well, so it's not the right time. It's not the right season. And you totally change your doctrine or do you put your big boy pants on and say, you know what, maybe something's wrong with me. Maybe the problem is me. So I start to seek after and press into God. That's why we have these services. That's why you have revival. That's why we fast. That's why we pray. So we can manifest God's word on this earth. So we can fulfill the prayer that Jesus told us. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. It's our responsibility to fulfill that prayer. There, there, we have some other friends that just, oh, the Lord's will be done. And they're like, everything's God's will. Not everything's God's will. If God's will, why did he tell us to pray for it to happen? Amen? We are ambassadors of Christ to this earth. Who's going to make God's will happen if we don't, church? Amen? God's given us an assignment to reach our generation before it's eternally too late. Don't worry, I didn't forget about you people over here. I started walking over there a lot. Sorry, Pastor. I love the left side just as much. Amen? <clears throat> we have an assignment. We can't, the people that have a doctrine of whatever happens is God's will, they, they don't want any responsibility. They want to put it in God's hands, and they don't want to work. And that's why I believe, and I was telling Pastor back there, I believe the next great move of God is coming out of rural America. Middle class, blue working collar Americans. You know why? Because they know how to work hard. They're hard working men and women who they know how to move America in the natural. But God's going to empower them to move America in the spirit as well. But the problem is people don't know. My people are destroyed due to a lack of knowledge. And there's many people sitting in the pews all over America in un-Pentecostal churches, unspirit-filled churches that have a desire to reach their generation. They want to make an impact. They just don't know how because the church just has them sitting around in Bible studies their whole life. The Bible says, be ye doers of the word of God and not hearers only. One of the issues we have is the culture got into the church. You know the culture when you go to school? You know how they test you? To learn, to learn. Do you know how to learn? Do you know how to learn? You go to college. They give you tests on what? To learn, not to do. We need to be tested on what we do. Jesus said, you'll know my people by their fruit. What they do, not what they know. Amen. It's like we have these aliens walking around. They have these huge heads, but no substance. Little bodies, big heads. But we need to get back to being doers of the word, not sitting around in Bible studies. We got to go out in the highways and the byways and reach our generation for Jesus. Amen. And I just so happen to know I'm looking at a bunch of people this morning, Pastor, that want to do that. Amen. I'm glad we're on the same page. Hallelujah. We want the same thing. But I know, I mean, hardworking Americans, middle class but you need to transfer that. Instead of working 70 hours at your job, how do you put that work into the kingdom of God? That's the bridge. We know how to work hard. We know what it takes. Hard work works. I was blessed with a father that taught me that. 
It doesn't matter what situation you get in. Guess what's going to get you out of that, son? Hard work. You put the time in, you work hard. Amen? Amen. And I know it's the same here. And I know there's a bunch of hardworking people I'm looking at. When things get tough, when your back's against the wall, you work hard. You go to work. You supply for your family. You supply for your children. But that same tenacity needs to get bridged over into the church of working hard for God to go out and reach the community. Imagine you put 60 hours in. I believe it was Jerry Savelle had a testimony. He was a very hardworking man. I believe he had a business. And the Lord spoke to him and says, if you put that same effort you put into your business and a secular job into the kingdom, you'll reach America overnight. Because that's the problem. You need to put your time in. Amen. We have to pray. We have to fast. And we have to move, church. Amen. Amen. You can't spell God without go. And you can't spell Satan without sat. Amen. You know why the dead sea's dead? It don't move. Amen. And it don't move is dead. We have to continue to grow and prosper and take ground for the kingdom of God. Amen. And I got a lot in the tank, Pastor. I can't wait for all God has. It didn't matter if old Kamala got in or, or Trump in my perspective. I'm happy, amen, the way it went. But I'm going, amen. I'm all in. If I got to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, down to three, I'll be standing, amen. amen. I love that tenacity. I love that violent faith of the men of God I've read about and hung around, amen. amen. Not some spineless, guppy Christian, amen. Amen. When someone calls and said, oh, you know, we're thinking about canceling your venue, find another one, amen? amen. We're going this way, amen? amen? It's like you're a freight train going 80 mile an hour, and you look ahead of you, and there's no more tracks, and there's a mountain, and you're like, let's go faster, amen? Let's go faster. Amen. Most people be hitting the brakes, and you're like a freight train. Something's going to happen, amen? amen? And that's why I love in the inner cities of America to go in, and that's what God has assigned me. One of my assignments the inner cities. You know, America is in ruins right now. Going to inner cities. You know, and yes, I'm, I'm, I'm for, I'm happy what happened. We're going to make America great again. But guess what? Trump can't make America great without the church. Amen? Amen? God has not given politicians power to make change in the culture. He's given the church of the Lord Jesus Christ his sweet anointing, his presence to go in and make a difference in the inner cities. The, you know, the inner seas of America are, are in that realm of we need a miracle. Amen? And there's only one place to get it. You can sit down all the big minds of the day, and they can say, you know, wow, this, this is impossible. It is tough with what we have. Well, guess what? I happen to know someone. Amen? And all through history, that's what it came down to. I believe our founding fathers were at that same point. You know, Great Britain was a huge empire. Could have been the one world government. It could have been over. That, they could have been the Antichrist. They had almost all the population. And here's the little 13 colonies. And they stood against, it would have been like the big Roman Empire. It was the, the uh, British Empire. But th how could they win? There's no chance. All logic would tell you there's no way you can win the biggest navy, biggest military might. And you know what? They said, we're going to believe God. Amen? Amen? We need a miracle, and we know where to get them from. Amen? There's a million reasons why this is a bad idea, but I got one. Amen? God's going to move on our behalf, and here we all are. And that's why socialism and communism want to get rid of the word of God because the word of God empowers the little guy. The one, the whole culture counts out. God will empower. You believe you can do all things through Christ. Those are tough people to reign over, amen? When you think you literally can do all things through Christ who strengthens me daily, there's no obstacle too big. I believe I can do the impossible. I believe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me daily. Those are tough people to manipulate and control, amen? Praise God. So we go in inner cities <laughs> to do crusades, and uh, we, do, we do giveaways, Pastor. We don't just put a big sign up and say, come hear about Jesus, and uh, the multitudes come. We do bill pays. So what we do is, you know, the government has prayed on the inner cities of America for the last, there's a reason why the inner cities are the way they are, and they've done it on purpose. Welfare supported the separation of marriages. 
If you were a woman in the inner cities with children, if you were married, you could not get welfare. So it forced women to not get married, or if they were, to get divorced so they could get welfare. They did it on purpose to target these people. And it's been going on for a long time. The abortion industry, preying on the inner cities of America. These people are preyed on by wicked people. And you go in there and tell them the truth. The truth of the matter, the people that are trying to help them are not trying to help them. They're trying to enslave them. They don't want them to have a job. They're rewarding them for not having a job and culture because they want to control their vote. Look at the map. Look at all the blue dots. It's all the big cities of people. They're manipulating and controlling. Welfare and unemployment is doing exactly what they want it to do. Keep people without a job. Stop them from prospering so big government can be their God. That's communism. That's socialism. And that's what we stand against. Because what you hope in is what you praise, and what you praise becomes your God. These people are worshiping the government. And the Bible says, you shall have no other gods before me. And to break that off the people. So I get up on the stage, Pastor, and they have no idea what's going on at all. We, we, we actually call it financial assistance. Because the government has preyed on these people so much with all their financial help and, and they're entitled and has such an entitlement mentality on these people. So we use the government's same marketing strategy. Peter said, be fisher of men. Amen? So we're fishing. So we make it look like a government program. So we go in there, get a big crowd. We did this. We launched out. As Pastor was saying, I worked for a ministry. And about a, a little over a year ago, we, I launched back out on my own. So there's no greater way to launch out than to do a big old crusade. Amen? Amen. Go after it. Amen. Yeah. Do what God called you to do. So we go into marketing. We do everything, flower the place. People come. So we open up. There's 2,000 people in Jacksonville, Florida in front of me. So uh, they're doing giveaways. We you know, get the community together, do some uh, games and stuff, and, which that in itself is great because, you know, 2,000 people there, they don't all like each other at all. You know what I mean? But they're playing games together. We throw the ball in the crowd. They're hitting it up. And it just you can feel unity. You know, so I, I'm in the back, and I'm back there praying in tongues, um, emergency tongues, you know, because who knows what's going to happen here in about 30 minutes. They, they have no, no idea who this white guy is, and I don't know if you know, but I am white, and they're mainly not white. <clears throat> so I'm back there praying, but I, I'm, I'm telling my wife, she's running the giveaways and the games. I said, do more community events. Throw the ball out. Get the community. And I can feel unity in the community as they're playing games together. And I said, we need more of those. So they start doing the giveaways that way. So I get up on the stage, and this is where the rubber meets the road. You're either, you know, the Bible says some are called and some are chosen. Amen? So I'm like, I'm, I'm either called or I'm chosen right now. We're going to find out real fast, first minute. So you take the mic in front of 2,000 people, and I lace into it, and I start preaching because they're there for bill pays. They're there for all this, the wrong reasons. And as an evangelist, as a man of God, you have to break that off of them. So I just spent all that money and time on giveaways, and I start lace preaching against them. Because Jesus doesn't empower you to be a victim or to be a, a drag on society. He's empowered you. Like God told Abraham, I have blessed you to be a blessing. It's not what can the world do for me. It's what can I do for my generation. How can I leave this world a better place than I found it? And when you have that mentality, it blesses your children and your children's children. Amen? So I get up there, and I start preaching what a bill pay can't do. If you have anxiety, depression, ain't no $100 bill pay going to fix that. Incurable disease, $100 bill pay, $500 bill pay, do you no good. Sexual morality, sin in your life, drug addiction, what's a bill pay going to do for that? So I started preaching. That's why God, 2,000 years ago, he stepped back and he said, I'm going to help humanity. I'm going to do something. He could have rained down. He could have made us all millionaires like that. That would have made things a lot worse. You know what money does? Not for these people here. You would be great for everyone here. Amen? But out there, it won't be. Because what does money do? It amplifies who you are. So if you have an addiction, a sin problem, sexual morality, it amplifies that. If you have a heart for God and the things of God, to see people saved, healed, delivered, you know what's going to happen if someone gives me a million dollars? You're going to see a lot of that. Amen? That's the difference. Amen? 
So that's why money would not fix society. Everyone says we need more education. What well, seems like more common core goes and more educated people are, depression has skyrocketed. It's like depression anxiety is laced with common core. So education isn't the problems. It comes down to it looks like humanity needs a savior. And his name is Jesus. And I start preaching the gospel. They need a savior. That's what they need. And they don't know. They do know, but they don't know. He came 2,000 years ago. And he wants to meet your needs today. Why does God want to heal you? Why does Jesus want to help you? Why does he want to break you through, set you free, give you joy, give you peace? Because he wants to be your savior. He's not just the savior of your soul. He's the savior of all of humanity. Your whole body, your mental health, your finances. What do you need this morning? Jesus wants to show himself real to you and be your savior this morning. He sees you. He sees you. And he's still moved with compassion. Among God being glorified, why God wants to heal you and meet you where you're at, he wants to be glorified. Heal the sick to glorify God. Another reason why God wants to meet you this morning, to show you how much he loves you. The Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion and healed them all. And just so happens, he sits at the right hand of God right now, and he's still moved with compassion. Jesus' compassion didn't die and not resurrected. His compassion and love for humanity rose from the dead as well. And he's sitting at the right hand of God, looking at you right now. Move with compassion. But there's many people, they don't want compassion, they want pity. Pity does no one no good. That you share, oh, pray for me. Do you want prayer? Do you want to be healed? Or do you want everyone to pity you? Do you want everyone to see, woe is you? Jesus never pitied anyone. Pity does nothing. Compassion moves the heart of God to heal you. Can anything separate you from the love of God? Can anything separate you from God's healing power this morning? He loves you. He wants to meet you. And he wants to be glorified this morning. Glorified. So the people start to clap, Pastor. So I'm preaching on this. I didn't forget where I was. I know you thought I forgot. So I start preaching. You need a Savior. And oh my God, 2,000 people start clapping. They start yelling. I didn't know what to do, and I'm word of faith. Amen. That's what we've been praying for, Pastor. You're like, you're gonna, you're, every person gets saved. They're all going to lo love it. They, they love me. Amen. Everyone loves me. That's a good prayer to have before you take this night. Everyone loves me. They know one I don't like me. <laughs> and they're cheering. It I had to step back. Wow. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't expect that. Amen. Because that's what people need. They need a savior to set them free and set free from sin. Sin is the problem of the inner cities of America. The wages of sin are death. And people need explained why sin's bad and why God loves you and why he sent Jesus to tell you sin's bad. Because sin opens you up to the demonic. It opens you up to, to Satan's will for your life. When you sin, Satan can control you, manipulate you. That's why you got to live a righteous life. So you can be led by the Holy Ghost. The wages of sin are death. When you start to sin, you start to go into the direction of destruction and death. It might not happen one time, but one time leads to two times. It might not even happen to you, but it could happen to your children and your children's children. Because what you tolerate, the sin you tolerate in your life, your children will fight, will battle. You might have a, okay, drinking a couple beers, something like that. But then your kid sees that, thinks it's okay, and they get addicted. It's not worth it to me. Amen? Not worth it at all. And I found out the hard way. Because I wasn't just the, going to parties. I was the party pastor. Amen? Miller Lite long necks. And we were, I was the party. The Bible says, whatever you do, do with all your might. Amen? So when I sinned, I did it with all my might. I guess why God liked me. He's like, I need that guy on my team. Amen? Because he's 110% in. I don't do anything lukewarm. So I can't be a lukewarm Christian. 
I didn't do anything lukewarm. When I partied, I went above and beyond. And I thought that was great. That was, we thought it was so much fun, laughing, blacking out, waking up, don't know where you're at. I mean, and we thought the more blackout stories you had, like, the better you are. Create this whole culture. So then my buddy, it was, it was a couple, long, I mean, it was 10 years ago. Best friend. I went to a Halloween party to college. He called me. It was a Sunday night and said, hey, Mason, want to go out with me? I said, no, I just got done, like three days of partying. Even this guy needs a break, <laughs> you know, from that. So I didn't, I didn't go with him. So it's that night. Uh, I get a phone call, and it's from one of his cousins, and said, hey, his name was Mike. Mike passed away on his way home from the bar. I thought, oh, my goodness. Now, now the party's kind of over. You know what I mean? That's why the Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. And oh, did we pleasure it. Oh, did we have fun. But it didn't matter how much fun sitting at that viewing and watching my best friend's viewing, that was not fun. There was no story. There was no beer. There was no party that made up the difference. And I learned the wages of sin are death. And that didn't have to happen. That wasn't God's will. That was the thief coming in the night. Most people hear this story, you know, God took your friend to, to put you in the right direction. God did not take him. We were sinning, and sin opens you up to the plan of the wicked one. Sin opens you up to destruction. And I saw destruction that morning. But luckily, I had enough of my mother taking me to Sunday school, singing like, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it deep and wide, deep and wide, that I, I got some revelation that God's good. I don't know how I did, but I got it. I knew God's good. So I'm sitting in that viewing, and everyone there's mad at God. How could God let this happen? He was a good guy. And I'm like, this ain't God. I know God's good. This is bad. It was like a John 10, 10 moment. The thief comes at night to kill, steal, and destroy. So I looked down in that pew. I was sitting where the choir sits, Pastor. Looked down, and I said, it's not over. It is not over till I say it's over. This is the beginning. I will be the good that comes from this day. I'll be the phoenix from the ashes that come out of this day. And that's the spirit of Christ. That's the Holy Spirit. That's what separates winners from losers. When you have a trial or tribulation, you can dwell in it, you can stay where you're at, or you can say, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to be a better person. You lose a loved one, a grandfather, a mother, a father. They sowed so much into you. It's tough to lose them. But they're in a better place, and now it's up to you and me. We have to go further than them. Many people say, if I could just be a quarter as good as that person. No, they want you to be ten times better than them. Amen? Go further. Let it motivate you to reach people. Let it motivate you to be a better person, better Christian, press into God. Thank God for the Spirit of God. Because I, I, who knows what could have happened? I, I could have I fell big time. Drugs, who knows? The door was wide open. But thank God for a praying mother. Lewis and Eugene, amen? Stir it up. I said, I'm going to be good. So uh, what I did from there, I got better. I wasn't blacking out, you know. I was still drinking, but I got a little better. So it went about a year, and uh, my job, I was traveling overseas, going to South Korea. And right before I left for South Korea, my uncle, great uncle, comes stumbling by and says, I have something, I think it belongs to you. So he hands it to me, and it was the Hoover Bible. So I'm, I'm named after my great-great-grandfather, Mason Ira Hoover. I'm Mason Kenneth Hoover. So my whole life, I've heard about this man who I'm named after. Obviously, I never met him, but a lot of people that were like 80, 90 years old right now had my grandfather as a school teacher. He was a one-room uh, one schoolhouse teacher. He'd travel around. So they'd come up and say, oh, I know who you're named after. I know you're, He was a good man. That's what I heard growing up. He was a good man. So uh, I get this Bible. At the time, I think nothing much of it. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Thank you. And uh, looking back, it was actually sold. When I was born, it was my great-grandfather's sale. I was like four months old, and my great-uncle bought that Bible. And he had it in his attic for like 23 years, something like that. And he just felt to bring it. So he brings it. So I go to South Korea and uh, go over there. South Korea is not a good place, Song Tong. It's like there's like a million bars in like a half mile. So if you have an addiction to like donuts, you don't want to get a Krispy Kreme. You know what I mean? You want to stay away from that. 
So here's this guy trying to be good. You know, I'm going to be good. I'll be the phoenix from the ashes. It felt good even when I said it. Amen. Praise God. But, uh, but here I go. So now I'm at this place. We're at, uh, they call them juicy bars. You can look up what that is. Um, and here comes this, this girl up to me. I'm with my friends. So there's the three of us sitting there. She comes up over to me. And I tell her, no, thank you, ma'am. I'm a man of God. And I'm like out there, you know what I mean? Because I've been drinking. And I'm telling this woman I'm a man of God. Just a weird thing to say when what I'm, I'm drinking drunk sitting there. So <laughs> that was the Lord. You know what I mean? I don't know what happened there. So I wake up the next morning, and I feel like the biggest piece of junk. Like I'm just letting everyone down. Like I'm trying to be good, and I can't. So for the first time, one of the first time in my life, I had an honest conversation with God. I told the Lord, I got down my knees, and I said, you're going to have to find someone else because I can't be good. And when I said that, it's like the door opened. And the presence of God came in the room and hit me, fell on the ground, weeping my eyes out. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Mason, I have blessed you, and I'll continue to bless you beyond reasoning because of the great men of God who came before you. Do as you wish. Gone. And that encounter I've been running on for the rest of my life. He, I felt God's grace, and I felt if I continue this life, I'd let everyone down, and I'd be blessed no matter what. Like what Jesus did on the cross is blessing us right now no matter what decisions you make. And I felt a generational blessing. I remember my grandfather's Bible, and it was like a new family tradition came in. We used to listen to Hank Jr., you know, family tradition, crank out to that. Well, there was another tradition, and it wasn't drinking and smoking. It was being a man of God. Amen? A new tradition came in the room. And what I accidentally did, and I didn't know it, Pastor, because after that, you have an encounter with God, and I'm the only person. I knew no one filled the Holy Ghost. Everyone was sensationalist. And the, no one I knew believed God moved now. And I think I'm the only person in the world that just had an encounter with God. Somebody needs to tell someone. God's still moving today. And what happened was I repented. That's what I did. I read the Bible. Because what, what do you do? So then I'll tell a story, and I'll go back to that. So... I, I leave that, that encounter with God. I start journaling. I go back home. I'm at the Legion, and I'm drinking, doing my thing. Because, you know, I don't know. I got an encounter with God. I'm not very smart. I'm not the brightest bulb. So I'm drinking because that was the culture. My friends, my whole, the whole ecosystem was doing that, and I was the leader. Amen? So I'm at the bar drinking. I had about six beers. And all of a sudden, it feels like someone's taking a sledgehammer to my belly pounding me and i'm like trying to be good time charlie laughing joking and it's somebody's hitting me right here with a sledgehammer so i told my girl my wife she was my girlfriend at the time i put my beer down i said we're out and i left there and i i, I didn't know what's going on you know you go to the hospital what's wrong with you mason well when i drink beer it feels like someone's punching me right here and they they'd be happy oh yeah here take this medication you know fat and big pharma's wallet you know here take this mason this will help everything no, I had to read the Bible yeah. and figure out what in the world. I knew I had an encounter with God. So I went through the Bible, and I found out I repented, and I got born again. That, that desire of partying and drinking left me, got ripped out of me. Yeah. And then I found how Jesus told his disciples, I will send you a helper who you know, the world does not know him, and he will convict the world of their sins. Yeah. I was getting convicted. God has like this uh, a sledgehammer closet, and I guess in heaven with angels. And as soon as he's like, that one there, grab the five-pound spiritual sledgehammer, and he's standing in front of people, whacking them with a hammer to convict them. That's what it felt. It felt like I was going to die if I kept drinking beer. And I thought, you know what? That's what America needs. Amen? If people could come to the altar and get born again like I did, and people underplay getting born again. Born again is a big deal. Amen? Your desires change. That's what needs to happen in religion. That's what religion is. It's people with worldly desires trying to live for Jesus. They're up there, and that's why there's angry preachers, because they want to live like the world because they have a desire for the world, but they can't. They need born again. You need to have a desire out of an abundance of a heart, a love for God that you want to serve the church. You want to be here. You want to advance God's kingdom.
There's nothing in life you're going to do out of religious obligation. There's no job. There's no sport. You, you look at anyone who's successful. They're not there. Well, you know, you look at some of the best quarterbacks. They're, they're there before it's time to practice because they have a love for the game. They want to succeed. They want to be good. And that's what you need in your heart for the things of God. And that's what God's going to do this morning. Put a passion and desire in you. Amen. Just like a passion and desire I had to party and drink, Amen. I have that same passion for God's kingdom. Amen. And just like no one was getting in my way to party, no devil's getting in my way to press the kingdom of God forward. Hallelujah. That's what happened to Paul. He got born again. Yeah. He didn't really change. He changed locker rooms. Amen. <laughs> Took up, put on another jersey and got in the kingdom side. Amen? The same passion he killed Christians with was the same passion he preached the gospel with. Amen? Mm, passion's good. Amen? Religion makes robots. Every desire, God created everything. Even anger. There's something in the Bible called righteous anger. But the devil perverts it. And religion says all anger is bad. No, you should be very angry when a grown man goes in a girl's bathroom. And if you have a little girl, you should get very angry. Amen? Jesus' teaching is to protect the innocent. And you're enabling pedophiles. Enabling them. That should make you angry. But sin not. Amen? It should motivate you to preach the gospel. It should motivate you. Anger is a good motivation as long as it's righteous anger. Amen. It's the right kind of anger. Amen. But religious one, religion wants to make robots. God created every desire, every emotion, but it needs to be holy and righteous and not perverted by the devil. Can I get an amen? Can you say that's good? That's why I said it. Amen. Thanks for the compliment. I got born again. And I've been running ever since. Amen. Running ever since. Thank you, thank you, Lord. And that's what I learned, amen, the hard way. Yeah. Of the wages of sin are death. Yeah. It's death. It opens you up. Yeah. Opens you up to these things. Yeah. And we've seen a great, great victory. Anytime the gospel's preached right. in the inner cities. And here's what happened. This is why I love it. Because you just don't know what's going to happen, Amen. It's either revival or a riot. You know what I mean? That's, that's a great place to be. That's exciting. Amen? So here's 2,000 people in front of me. I don't really have an, a, a, the team, a, a big, big team. You know, we're like on bare minimum, skeleton crew. So there's 2,000 people, and man, they're locked in. I'm preaching. I have the crowd in front of me locked in. Next thing you know, some guy tries to beat up some 13-year-old in the corner of the crowd. So I had, you know, police officer there. So he calls for backup. So I'm in the way, in the middle of calling the altar call. So the people in front of me, I have them locked in. So they're coming to the altar. I'm playing in the background. I have decided to fo follow Jesus. You know, I have decided. That's why I let him sing worship and not me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't really let him pastor. Um, so I have that plan. So here comes cruisers on the cr crusade grounds, <laughs> flying in there. And most people there, you know, they're probably not too friendly to police. They might have something going on. So a lot of them flee. And he goes over. He's like stu cuffing, stuffing this guy. Here comes the altar. I'm leading the, the prayer of salvation while a police officer is arresting someone. So after the crusade, the police officer comes up to me and says, never experienced that one before. <clears throat> Putting a guy arresting him while in the background is, I have decided <laughs> to follow Jesus. Because it's the collision of two worlds. That's what's happening. It's, it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ standing against the Antichrist spirit. And it's colliding. It's like there's a wall on that field. It's like the kingdom and the kingdom of darkness colliding. And we just see which spirit is the greater spirit. Amen? We just see who carries the greater spirit. The Antichrist spirit or the spirit of Christ. Amen? The Holy Ghost. He who's with me is greater than he who's in the world. Amen. It needs to get in your spirit. May the whole world be against me. But if God before me. Amen. And that's what I preach to these people. That's what I preach. You know, a lot of these people think everyone's racist and they're in their situation because some racist white person. That is horrible. 
No person holds your prosperity. No one's sitting in some skin color. God holds my prosperity. So I tell the people, may the whole freaking world be racist. If God is for me, who can be against me? Who? Show me who. Where are you? Amen. That's what they need to get in their spirit. They're going to make it. And their God's going to break them through. Because whenever you put someone's success and prosperity in someone else's hands, it keeps them trapped in a box. They're in bondage to that. And God wants to raise them up to be a mighty blessing to their generation. And the same thing happens to many people. There's always a reason why you're not succeeding. It's because your supervisor, because your management. Woe is me. Well, guess what? And then Christianity. Well, I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian. No. Welcome to planet Earth. Amen. People don't like it sometimes. Amen. But you're going to make it. You continue to go forward. God holds your prosperity. Not some man. And do all things unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. You're serving God. Amen. And that's what we tell the people. And I tell them to get a job. That's what they need to hear. They need to get off these programs. People are there. They're waving their hand. I mean, who here needs a house? Who here needs breakthrough? I tell them the problem isn't your wallet. The problem is between your ears. That's the issue. Your brain. Amen. Amen. Get off government programs and get a job. The Bible says faith without works is dead. You want to prosper? Set your alarm clock. Get a pair of work boots. Amen. That's what they need to hear. Amen. Yes, they're going to come to the altar and get saved, but they need a job. The Bible says if you do not provide for your family, you're worse than any heathen or wicked person. And if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Amen. And I didn't get shot. Amen. They loved it. That's a miracle. Amen. Amen. Then I realized, maybe I'm chosen. Amen. Amen. And then the miracles. Miracles. Hallelujah. Mm. The day miracles broke out. I'll just tell you my whole life story. Amen. Why I'm at it. <laughs> So I mentioned how, you know, I was praying for people. No one was getting hit, healed, and God called me to a healing ministry. I start pressing in. The Bible says earnestly desire the gifts of the Spirit. What does that look like? Well, what does that all entail? Most of you think that's just, that's just going to revival services, fasting, praying, going in your closet. And that is. That, has, that is one aspect of it. But another aspect of it is serving earnestly desire the best gifts Amen. when you desire something you serve there's no one in the bible that moved in miracles that was not discipled that's a fact they served most people understand giving given you shall receive you give this and you believe god for an abundance a breakthrough it's same thing with serving the church when you come and lead worship, you're on the worship team, you're at that door ushering, you're sowing, amen, into God. And you need to be expecting a harvest. For me, it was the gift of healing. Nothing was happening, no one's getting healed, and I said, I'm going to serve a ministry. I'm going to serve until it happens. I didn't know what to do. When you don't know what to do, serve, amen? That's a good place to do. Honor and serve and do it to the best of your ability. Serve the church like you're serving Jesus. Would you have a upside down face serving Jesus? I'm just here serving the church, you know. There needs to be a joy and abundance, a high honor to serve the church. It's the perspective of the heart. It's the same difference of someone who sows joyfully. Than someone who show, sows grudgingly out of an, a religious obligation. You never get anything. Same thing when you serve the church. You should have an expectation. And like I said, maybe we have two different desires here. I wanted to see divine healing. I was desiring the gifts why I served. So I told whoever I was serving, call me at any time. I'll do whatever you need. Amen. I'm not a drag. It's not an obligation. And there's some, some people, if pastor calls you, you're, 
It's like a drag. Well, we'll see if I can do that. I don't know. So then pastor stops calling. Be a person that when pastor calls, what can I do for your pastor? How can I help? How can I push the vision forward? And God honors that. There's a reason why God picks certain people. This isn't some God's sovereign will. His ways are greater than our ways. That, that, that's true. But Jesus said we're to grow in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ daily. He wants to reveal kingdom secrets to you. Not to stay in the place of, oh, your will is higher than ours. We know nothing. You know, I can't stand that. You're to read. We have a, this is a big book. There's a lot of God's ways in here. That's why we read the Bible. So we know God's ways. We know his character. We know who he is. So I serve with all my heart. 110% in. And then I start to realize there's a blessing on the other side of serving. So then we create this culture, Pastor. We're fighting to serve. When something needed done in the ministry, we're fighting to serve. I never forget the ministry. They're going to Sight and Sound in Lancaster, and they need someone like post security by a car. Yeah, like, very simple. So like I had plans. I rearranged all my plans. Wake up super early. Drive like hours there, and I'm like ten minutes away. Get a phone call. Hey Mason, we don't need you anymore. So, so most people, this is how I knew this thing has changed. Most people are like, you got to be kidding me. He made me drive all the way here. I changed all my plans. Something came out of me, and I was upset because I couldn't serve. Because I knew there was a blessing on the other end of me serving. And I just felt like someone stole my blessing. Somebody stole my opportunity to be blessed. That's what the helps ministry was established for in the Bible. Book, book of Acts. Stephen, Philip, and the other five. To serve, to develop, to be discipled, and to be found faithful. That's why you serve the church. This, how, this, this is a huge kingdom key here on the gifts of the Spirit. God's not going to give you a gift if you're not faithful. The last person he did was Satan. He anointed him and gave him gifts and he was found unfaithful. He couldn't be trusted. So that's why through the Bible, God is looking for faithful people. He doesn't want to divide his church anymore. It happened once. He's not going to give his anointing to someone who's unfaithful. You need to show yourself faithful to the Lord. The church is full of talented people. We have enough talented, gifted people. We need faithful people. People that will say, I'm going to stick and stay and make the devil pay. I will be here serving till an angel comes to me to tell me to do something different. Till God himself comes down here. That's the tenacity you need to have about serving in the church. And God sees that. Your promotion does not come from pastor or man. It comes from the Lord. And I knew when mine came. Amen. I've forsaken everything for the gospel. I want it to be like Jesus. I was on a hot pursuit to be like Jesus. Who would not want to be like Jesus? Who would not want to go up to someone with depression, anxiety, and tell it to leave and the Prince of Peace come in and to see their face glowing with joy? They've been dealing with issues. People are dealing with issues. Sick for 10 years, taking medication. What a burden. Then the devil starts whispering in your ear, you'll be like this forever. Your children will deal with this. Then depression sinks in, and they'll walk up and to use that magnificent name of Jesus and take authority and see that person healed, running around the sanctuary, full of joy, a whole family transformed. Who want, want to be like Jesus? Mm. Who wouldn't? So I'm serving. I, gave, I put my whole life in a U-hole, moved to Tampa, Florida, like Pastor said. Pulled my daughter. She was in school with her friends. She's crying, missing her friends. Everyone's saying, I'm a crappy dad. Why would you do that to your family? All these other things. And uh, <laughs> they don't know. Amen. They're not saved. They don't go to church. They, obviously, they don't read the good book. Even Christians. I mean, I, I don't care if the world complains at me, but it's Christians. Did you ever read this? Amen. Forsaken all. You know what I mean? Like, left mother, brother. Like, I was living the scripture. Leave everything behind. Leave wife, mother, brother. You know, anyone, you know, has to deny their father. I, I read that scripture in front of my parents. To deny my parents to serve Christ. With tears in my eyes. Shove everything you home, move to Tampa, Florida. 
And then things weren't looking like they should be. But that's a good place to be, amen? You're believing God. So I just thought, well, I'll just serve this ministry for the rest of my life. You know, the call of God, what, it's just not happening. People aren't getting healed, you know, it wasn't there. So I'm in Tennessee, Pastor, <clears throat> and just minding my own business, serving the Lord, amen? Yeah. Doing 110%, and I wake up one morning, and it feels like there's a ball in my belly to pray for the sick. I'm like, it's happening. Today's the day. I, it's like this ball was in my belly. Take the outreach team out. First person I walk up to, this guy, he's like 19 years old. He had a bummed ankle, so he's limping around there. So I said, can I pray for you? He says, yeah, sure. Grab a hold of his ankle, Pastor. I feel his ankle shift in my hands. It cracks. He goes like this. I said, are you healed? He goes, did you hear that? He starts running around. I said, it's happening. I got it. I got it. I got it. At that moment, I felt like Oral Roberts, Pastor. I said, bring the sick. Line them up. Today's the day. Next person went to. I told my team. I said, find me the sick. This, it, I got it. I got it. Next person, he said, well, I prayed for someone's salvation. They had a bum wrist. Let's go. So now I have like eight people behind me. You know what I mean? So in, in natural, you think you have to like perform something. Well. Not at all. I know I had it. It's no different than me saying, let's go for a ride in my car. Amen? Right. My car's out there. I got the key. We're going to go. Amen? That's how the gifts of the Spirit are. Yeah. So should I go to her and grab her wrist? Boom, pops. She's like, oh, my goodness. I'm like, find me the sick. Let's go. So we're going, I'm going door to door, pounding on doors. Is there any sick among you? This crazy thing's happening. When I pray for people, they get healed. Can I pray for you? This lady comes. I knock on one door. Door opens. I said, is there any sick among you? Crazy thing. I said that. She said, looks up and says, yeah, she needs prayer. And here's this lady, you know, on the couch, her legs up. I don't even know what happened to my, her leg. Did not matter to me. Amen. She was getting healed. So she's laying there like. She has, like, no bra on, but she had a shirt on. You know, she's laying there. You pray for her. Praise God. So she comes out. I grab her knee. It's in a brace. Pray for her. I feel her knee shift under my hands. I said, stand up. And she's like, well, I, it's, yeah, it's, it's better. She sits down. I rip the brace off, and I start moving her leg up and down like a 90. Her whole family goes ecstatic. They're like, oh, my goodness. I'm like, that's a good sign. Something good's happening here. Pull her up. She starts walking around. She's like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Praise God. I got it. Amen. And that's how the early church and any great man of God who moved in signs, wonders, and miracles, they understood one thing. They got it. Amen. Peter understood this. He was at the gate of beautiful, walked up to this lame man, and he said, sir, silver and gold I do not have, but what I got I give you. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. He gave him something. And it was the gift of healing. It was the charisma in the room. All Peter said was, look on me. How do you receive a miracle? Just look on me. Look on me and receive it. That's how the gifts work. Amen? Just from serving. And I preached Philip and Stephen's ministry for like two years straight. Amen? Serving the church births miracle ministries. Amen? That's what birth, they, they were butlers, waiting tables. Yeah. I mean, humbled themselves under the mighty hand of God. You can't find Peter's name without seeing full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, full of power. Yeah. He was a big hitter. But he humbled himself. He didn't say, no, pastor, you know, I'm full of faith in the Holy Ghost. You know, I can't wait tables. I can't hand food out. I'm not called to do that. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, not the call of God. Amen. Plug the hole. If you're on the ship and you have the anointing to be the captain, it doesn't matter how great of a captain you are. If there's a hole in the floor, you're all going down. <laughs> Pastor, what do you need today? Oh, you need, you need a room painted? Well, guess what? I just so happen got the anointing to paint today. Amen? Amen. That's the key. Everyone wants, you know, yes, there are certain things God called you to do. But when it comes to God's kingdom, whatever it takes, amen, keep the boat afloat and going forward. I'm not called to do that. I'm called to God's kingdom, amen. And I love his kingdom, and I'll do whatever it takes, amen, to grow the kingdom of God. These, this is big. This is how you get God's attention, Amen. This is how you go from being called the chosen. This is how the gifts of the Spirit work. I can lay hands on everyone here today. 
But impartation may not happen to majority. It's going to happen to those that are faithful. Those that serve. Those that are chosen and called and God has seen your faithfulness. That's why you see ministries, the people usually that work for the ministry, if they don't become familiar, actually receive the most from the man of God in ministry. Why? Because they serve and they honor the gift. They honor the gift in the house. And what you honor is what you get. And most people you can't re- will stop receiving from your pastor because you get familiar. You see him as a great guy, and he is. Phenomenal. But he's a man of God, called to be the shepherd of the house. That's a high calling. That's, that's a higher calling than a president or any UN rubbish. He's called by God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, to be your pastor. And you need to see him as your pastor and man of God. That's a key. You will, you'll stop receiving from God when you think your pastor is your buddy or your friend. And yes, he is a friend, but you need to see him as God sees him, as a man of God. And that's why I stopped. I mean, when I'm around ministries, I'm radical, if you didn't tell. I just don't want to cross that line. So I don't joke with, with ministers. I do not make a joke. I, 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 they want to be my friend, but I never cross the line. I draw a line in the sand. He's not my buddy. He's a man of God. And God has sent me, sent him to me to bless me, to help me, to correct me, to guide me, to develop me into what God wants me to be. And when you just make these little tweaks, little tweaks, little adjustments, everything changes. These are kingdom keys. Amen. Kingdom keys. If you want to flow in the gifts of the spirit. Gifts of the Spirit. So, now I know I got it. Amen? Now I can go on the stage and pray for people. Amen? Because I, I think I'm an evangelist, so I think like critical people think. Amen? Like a sinner in a bar, you know? So if only people are getting healed at churches, wow, well, they're just paying those people. They're, you know, they have all these excuses. So that's why I'm pressing. My goal before I leave this earth, one of my goals, hopefully it happens I might need to make other goals because what the Lord doesn't, then I have no goals, you know what I mean? But like someone comes up and like their legs chopped off from here down, all right? And we pray for that, and his leg whoosh, grows out. You can't deny that one, amen? amen? You can't, you cannot deny the power of God on that one. For all to see, amen? amen. Jesus demonstrated miracles in public to display his power. His glory and his love. See, one passage that the Bible says Jesus waited for the crowds and then he started to minister. Well, you don't have to do it in public. Yes, you do. Amen. For people to see. You don't glorify God praying for someone in the back room and no one to see. Amen. It's for everyone to see, to demonstrate his power. That's why God had such a desire to deliver the Israelites from Pharaoh. He actually brought his, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did it on purpose. He hardened his heart so he could demonstrate his power to the people. And read through that. There's like 10 points of why he did that. So they could worship God. So they could tell their children and children, children of what God did. So Pharaoh would know that he is Lord. And I love that scripture. He brought down his strong right hand on Egypt and if you look at the, new, at the early church in Acts chapter 4, there was huge persecution. The Bible says it was coming from Herod, Pontius Pilate, Gentiles, and Pharisees. So, I mean, that's like the whole government's coming against you. All right, that's pretty bad. All right, now the whole church is, the whole religious establishment is coming against you. And then heathens, you know, Gentiles, you know, people in the culture are all coming against the early church. And they didn't pray, Lord, strike them dead. L- look at their prayer. They said, Lord, stretch down your hand with signs, wonders, and miracles. Miracles is what they prayed for. But, you know, the problem's over here, and they're praying for healing. Because the covenant changed a little bit. God's judgment right now in the new covenant is on sickness and disease. He loves people. The Bible says, 1 John 3, 8, Jesus came to destroy the work of the enemy. 
What's his work? Sickness and disease. He hates you being sick. He hates sin in your life, and he wants to destroy it out of your life. Not you. He loves you, but you have to give it to him. It was laid on him on Mount Calvary. Affirmity, sickness, disease, everything you're dealing with was laid on Jesus. You have to give it to him so he can destroy it. His strong right hand to heal. Praise God. So let's talk about Jacksonville. I'll show you a video of what the Lord did because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So a video must be like 10,000 words, something like that. But yeah, I think it has it up right there. If you just, so this is what happened in Jacksonville. I was telling you uh, all about what the Lord did. This was actually day two. So we did a two-day event on it. Can you roll the video? You ready? Perfect. Enjoy. Got out God of a jail a, a week ago. Plan. You might have, well, you've tried to run from the call of God, but you can't get away from it. You have a praying brother, grandmother, or mother. Hold my hand, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for my brother. He's a mighty man of God. His son will be greatly blessed because of his decision he makes tonight. Mark him for a CNA company, and I, they gave me her, and I worked for her for 40 hours a week with the company that I worked for. and. She's been laid up on a couch every day, all day. I get her up, I try to work with her. She doesn't want to do anything, and if she hurts too much, and oh my God, this is, this is <laughs> so, so for seven months? Seven months. And how many surgeries? She's been through three. Three surgeries? Three. And she couldn't stand like that? No, she couldn't even walk like that. Lord. Is this true? It's true. Lord. Are you happy? Yes. <laughs> Do you believe Jesus is the healer? I do. You better, amen? amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this precious lady. Thank you for a healed tibia. Her leg is never the same. She will run and not grow weary all the days of her life. And she'll look back on this day and remember Christ the healer. Praise God. Praise God. Give me a hug.
Praise God. Put your hands there for everything the Lord did. And it's, it's wonderful what God did. You know, when you're pressing into God and believing God for, for years, and then it happens, and it makes it all worthwhile. It's like the day I got called to be an evangelist, I saw that day, amen? It's what the Lord showed me, amen? He gave me a picture, and as I was praying for people, as we saw everything that happened, I knew, amen? That's what I saw. That's what was on the Lego box, amen? Then the, then the God gives you pieces. Praise God. Praise God. So if you're here today and you need a healing or miracle in your body, no matter what it is, I'd love to pray for you. We saw a huge breakthrough. I just opened the prayer line up and had people testify of what was wrong with them. And I put the mic to their face without even knowing what was wrong with them. We had a lady that was blind for 15 years. 15 years. You know, you're like on the prayer line, Pastor. Like, what's wrong with you? Blind 15 years. Like, oh boy. <clears throat> you know, and you're on the speaker. Everyone can hear. Amen. Yeah. Everyone hear what's going on. So we're either going to get booed off the stage or God's going to heal them. Amen? Amen. And I prayed for her. <laughs> her eyes came open. She could see she was touching my nose. I'm like making sure because I'm not here to hustle anyone, Pastor. I'm not here to hustle the power of God. If you're not healed, you're not healed. Amen? I want to make sure they were healed. Amen? Amen? Integrity. God doesn't need my help. Amen? To heal people. And I went over to test. I went like three people. Is this true? Is this true? Is this true? And she, oh my goodness. Healed. You could see every person that came to the prayer line got healed. Right in the middle of Jacksonville. I'm praying like Holy Ghost, do you got it in the background? We had a revival there. Amen. Signs, wonders, and miracles. God moving. I, I footage. You even see my face. I'm like rolling. I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, they're getting healed. I'm like, woo, oh my, praise God. <laughs> praise God. So if you need a miracle, whatever it may be, joy, peace, dealing with a rough time, I want to pray for you. That's the good news. You don't need to walk out of here the same way you came in. That heavy burden will be lifted at this altar in Jesus' mighty name. This morning's your morning to be set free, delivered. Whatever you need to believe God for it. I want to pray for you so we can glorify God. Amen. We can brag on God. And he has not forgotten his covenant with you for freedom. So if you would like a miracle or healing in your body this morning, come to this altar, and I'd love to pray for you. You can make your way to the altar. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. We thank you in advance, Father. We thank you, Father, for bringing the people. We, we give you the glory and the praise for the miracles, for meeting the people. If the yeah, ushers just line the people up, please. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for heavy burdens being lifted this morning. What a high honor it is to be used of God. Thank you, Father, for the victory. Thank you for the people, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you the glory and all the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for all the precious people that just came to you by faith. They came to believe that you are still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You are still Christ the healer. You are still the great Messiah. And you have not forgotten this morning your covenant of divine healing and deliverance. Father, I thank you. For the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. You have anointed me to heal the sick, cleanse the leper, and raise the dead. Right now, I stir up the gift. The gift of healings. The gift of miracles on the inside. And right now, I take authority over any sickness and disease and I rebuke it now in the name of Jesus any foul spirit of affliction or firmity go now in Jesus mighty name tumor leave back pain go now in Jesus mighty name arthritis goes at the name of Jesus cancer leave that person now in the name of Jesus Christ kidneys be healed now in the name of Jesus. Spinal cord, be healed. Knee, be healed. Mind, be healed now in the name of Jesus. Emotions, be healed now in the name of Jesus. Digestive system, be healed now. Stomach, be healed now. Thank you, Father. All the people's bodies come in alignment with your word. And Jesus healed all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Miracle working power of Christ. So what we're going to do right now, I need you to test your bodies. Do what you couldn't do before and see if you couldn't bend, bend. You couldn't walk, walk. You couldn't run, run. Had a lady with a heart condition. She came in with a crutcher. She could barely move. And I prayed and she started darting around the room running. And I said, I need to talk to her. Amen. I need to see what the Lord just did for her. Test your bodies out. Ben, do something you couldn't do before. Do something you couldn't do before. And when you find the pain is gone, just raise your hand at me, please. Raise your hand if the pain's gone. I want to know if you're healed. Raise your hand. Someone's clapping, I don't know. And then I want to pray for people individually as well. So if you just got healed, put your hand up. You can testify. And then I'm going to go individually and pray for people. What's going on down here? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anyone healed? Praise God. Praise God. I felt, I felt that word. Would you share what the Lord did for you? My, my stomach and intestines are inflamed and we're bleeding. And I haven't really eaten in a couple weeks. And I'm not in pain. She said she's not in pain. She had issues with her stomach, church. Look what Jesus did. Are you happy? Praise God. She said she's hungry. Can someone get her some food? <laughs> Praise God. What a mighty God we serve. He loves you. And the same God that healed her is going to heal you this morning. Is there anything too difficult for our God? Put your hands together what Jesus did. Now I want to pray for each and every one of you in the line.
What can Jesus do for you, brother? You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Share with it. What the Lord just do for you, brother? My shoulder's been in unbearable pain the last three days, and now it doesn't hurt whatsoever. Who healed you this morning? Jesus. Come on, give him praise. Hurt shoulder, gone in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. What can Jesus do for you, ma'am? Church, we have a sister in need right now. Stretch your hands out right now. She's dealing with an issue. Who here believes Jesus wants to heal her, church? Who believes he's the resurrected Savior of the world? Who believes there's nothing too hard for our God? Stretch those hands out. Ushers, make sure you get this baby here. Be careful. Father, I thank you for this vessel. What a wonderful mother right now. I come against that right now in the name of Jesus, holding her mind, and I adjure uh, it now in Jesus' mighty name. It breaks today in the name of Jesus Christ, and a mind of Christ. Woo It'll flood from her belly, a peace that passes all understanding. You'll never deal with that again in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How do you feel, sister? at the right place amen you stay plugged in here okay there these people are here for you amen believe God with you you and your children I'm telling you this little guy here whole different life you stay plugged in the local church amen great people you're a mighty man of God love you buddy what can Jesus do for you I was in Lakeland, Florida, and this lady came, abused as a child, like four times as a little girl, dealing with depression. understanding and I told her the next time I see you you'll be smiling and you will not be able to cry and she came and looked me up the next day full of joy smiling she was I don't know I can't cry praise God I said who did that for you she said Jesus 
And the same thing's going to happen to you, sister. The Prince of Peace is knocking at your door right now. Never the same in Jesus' mighty name. Hold my hand, sister. Do you believe Jesus wants to heal you? Yes. That settles it. Amen. Stretch those hands out, church. I'm going to need you out there. We got a sister in need right now in the name of Jesus. The precious name above every other name. That lying devil. I adjure you now in Jesus' mighty name. It breaks off of this sister right now. She is beautiful. She is loved. All made in his image for such a time as this. Created for such a time as this. She is beautiful. She's smart. She's courageous. She's a leader. She's anointed in Jesus' mighty name. And I thank you for the Prince of Peace, the reign in her spirit, that she'll have an overwhelming joy, the fruit of the Spirit, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, wants to be your Savior this morning, your Savior of depression right now. And I thank you, she'll have an overwhelming peace. <laughs> she'll sleep so good tonight and she'll wake up with joy unspeakable in Jesus' mighty name. I think it just happened. <laughs> Jesus! Say this after me. Say, I am healed. I am healed. Full of the Holy Ghost. Full of the Holy Ghost. With peace and joy. Peace and joy. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Give me a... I tell you that when you were praying over me, I feel this warmth coming all over my body. <laughs> That's Jesus. He's at work this morning. He has not forgotten his covenant. And he loves you. Never forget this day. <laughs> Give me a hug. Oh, how he still moved with compassion. And we're just getting started. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Sister, what can Jesus do for you? I um, had a problem with my neck and my lower back. And uh, I just want total healing, complete healing. How much pain do you have right now? It's very slight because I've already been touched, but I, I just want to be aligned totally <laughs> and my strength back and not so tired all the time, just strengthened. So you came in here this morning with pain in your back and now the pain's gone or? It wasn't, no, my back's doing pretty good, but I had it last week and could hardly walk. So I was having trouble with the, the back and the neck. It's been three months, but I just want that total healing where I can get my strength back and you know praise God I usually have to check because some people are already healed and they're like oh the pain's gone <laughs> so I just want to make sure but we're gonna pray for your strength amen you're gonna run and not grow weary amen well I'm gonna claim it with you we're gonna believe God that that little pain of pulling it goes right back to hell where it came from amen all right sister hold my hand do you believe Jesus wants to heal you? Yes, I do. That settles it. <laughs> Father, we have a believer in the house this morning coming to you for healing. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we adjure that pain off her body right now. Be filled right now. May a supernatural strength come upon her. She will run and not grow weary all the days of her life, Father. Woo! Elwood City track team better look out. We got a runner in the house. Amen. Woo, praise God. Thank you, Father, for bringing it to completion. Thank you for her faithfulness, Father. All the seed she has sowed. May you bring her the harvest now in Jesus' mighty name. What can Jesus do for you, sir? My shoulder um, has been out for a couple months. And it's, it's not so What's the pain level right now? Uh, probably about an eight. How, did, did you do something to hurt your shoulder? What happened? Just moving it. They it's, you said eight months. How long has it been like that? End of July. End of level eight pain. Hey, okay. Church, we have a brother in need of a miracle. He has level eight pain in his shoulder. He's been dealing with this since July. Brother, do you believe Jesus wants to heal you? Yes. That settles it. Hold my hand, brother. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. Thank you for this man of God who boldly came to the altar. 
to meet Christ the healer this morning. And right now in the name of Jesus, pain, go now in Jesus' mighty name. Infirmity, leave now. Swelling, go now. And I command shoulder, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ that you could be glorified this morning, that you have not forgotten your covenant with this man, Christ the healer. Be healed now in Jesus' name. All right, brother, move that around. What's going on? It feels good. Yeah, it's gone. He said the pain is gone back to hell where it belongs. Put your hands together, church. Praise God. Enjoy your miracle, brother. What can Jesus do for you, sir? Clarity. Vision. Direction. I got one good vision for you. Word of life, church now. Pray for my brother-in-law. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's your brother-in-law's name? Jeff. All right, cancer. Do you believe Jesus wants to heal your brother-in-law? Yes. Let's do this, church. I'm going to need you out there. Stretch your hands out. We have a brother in need this morning. Hold my hand. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. Give this brother vision and clarity, correction and direction. Woo. Thank you, Father. Speak to the night hours. Prompt his spirit. Put a burden in his heart that when he sees what he needs to do, may his heart burn within him. Holy Spirit, prompt this brother. And I pray for his brother that has cancer. May he know right now that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for him right now. We adjure that cancer right now. May it die up at the root in the name of Jesus. Cells be healed now in the name of Jesus by his brother's faith. Divine healing in his life in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming for prayer, brother. Love you. What can Jesus do for you, brother? Church, we have a saint in need to carry the gospel for his knees. Stretch your hands out.